On August 12, 2000, the unthinkable happened. Russia's unsinkable submarine, the Kursk, was ripped apart by a massive explosion and sank into the icy depths of the Barents Sea. In an instant, 118 sailors appeared to meet their tragic end. The world watched in horror as the pride of Russian naval engineering lay shattered on the ocean floor. This catastrophic event not only claimed lives, but also peeled back the curtain on a system riddled with secrecy and hubris. Step into the chilling saga of the Kursk, a submarine whose dramatic demise shook the very foundations of maritime history. Launched in 1994, the Kursk was a formidable submarine in Russia's Navy, belonging to the Oscar II class, designed to carry nuclear cruise missiles for long-range strikes. Stretching about 154 meters in length and weighing 18,000 tons underwater, it boasted state-of-the-art technology for evading enemy detection. The Kursk was a titan of the seas, powered by two nuclear reactors that propelled it through water at speeds up to 32 knots. Armed with 24 granite missiles, it had the reach to strike distant targets over 600 kilometers away, a testament to its formidable presence in naval warfare. The submarine was built with a sturdy double hull to withstand extreme underwater conditions, making it ideal for extended missions under the Arctic ice or in remote ocean waters. Its crew consisted of highly skilled professionals, trained to manage its complex systems and execute strategic military operations. Despite its sophistication and the expertise of its crew, the Kursk was part of a navy struggling with financial constraints after the Soviet Union's collapse, which impacted maintenance and readiness. This brewing storm of neglect and decay set the stage for what would unfold during a routine naval exercise in the unforgiving waters of the Barents Sea. On August 12, 2000, during a large-scale naval exercise in the Barents Sea, disaster struck the Kursk submarine. The exercise was intended to display the prowess of Russia's naval fleet, but it ended in catastrophe. A massive explosion occurred within the submarine, which was powerful enough to register as seismic activity detectable as far away as Alaska. This initial blast was soon followed by a second, even larger explosion, believed to have been caused by the detonation of warheads on board. The force of the explosions was devastating. The Kursk was quickly incapacitated, losing all power and propulsion, and sank to the seabed at a depth of about 108 meters. In the crucial hours following the sinking of the Kursk, the response from the Russian Navy was mired in confusion and denial. As the reality of the disaster slowly emerged, the Navy's command structure struggled to coordinate an effective rescue operation. Critical time was lost in the initial phase, during which the Navy did not acknowledge the accident publicly or to international bodies that could have assisted. Rescue teams faced daunting challenges. The Kursk lay at a depth of 108 meters, a reachable depth for rescue operations, but the severe damage inflicted by the explosions made any conventional rescue nearly impossible. The submarine was equipped with escape hatches designed to allow crew to exit in emergencies. But the violent force of the blasts had warped these mechanisms, making them unusable. Compounding the difficulties, adverse weather conditions and rough seas delayed the deployment of specialized rescue vessels. When international help was finally accepted, days had already passed, a delay that would prove fatal. As the international rescue teams arrived, they brought with them advanced deep submergence rescue vehicles, including the British LR-5 and the US Mystic. These vessels were designed to operate under extreme depths, equipped with sophisticated navigation systems, and capable of docking with compromised submarine escape hatches. Alongside them, remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, were deployed to clear debris and assess hull integrity. Equipped with high-definition cameras and hydraulic arms, these ROVs attempted to perform tasks too risky for human divers, under conditions marked by poor visibility and unpredictable currents. Inside the Kursk, a grim situation unfolded. 23 crew members had survived the initial explosions and had found refuge in one of the submarine's few intact compartments. There, they awaited a rescue that was becoming increasingly unlikely as their air supply dwindled. These men managed to bang on the hull, sounds that were detected by rescue teams. But these faint hopes were crushed as each rescue attempt failed due to technical challenges and the deteriorated state of the submarine's hull. Eventually, it was determined that the survivors had died of hypoxia only a few hours before the first successful attachment of a rescue submersible to the submarine's hull. 
a tragic end to a frantic race against time. In the weeks and months that followed the Kursk tragedy, the Russian government faced a storm of criticism both domestically and internationally. The initial refusal to acknowledge the disaster and accept international help sparked outrage among the public and the international community. The delayed and disorganized response was seen as indicative of broader issues within the Russian military and government, highlighting outdated practices and a lack of transparency. Families of the deceased sailors were devastated and angry. They received inconsistent information from official sources, and many felt that the government was more concerned with saving face than saving the lives of the crew. Protests and vigils became common as families and supporters demanded answers and accountability. President Vladimir Putin, who had taken office just a few months prior, faced significant criticism for his initial aloofness regarding the tragedy. His delayed response and perceived indifference during the crisis damaged his image and raised serious questions about his leadership. The media, both in Russia and internationally, scrutinized every step of the government's response, further amplifying public disapproval. This scrutiny was a new challenge for Putin, who had inherited a country accustomed to tightly controlled state media. As public pressure mounted, the Russian government was compelled to take action. This led to a series of investigations that exposed severe shortcomings in naval operations and safety measures. Investigations revealed that a torpedo had exploded, likely due to a malfunction, setting off further explosions of warheads. This contradicted earlier statements by the Russian Navy, which had suggested everything from collisions with foreign submarines to old World War II mines as possible causes. The catastrophe began with the malfunction of a Type 6576A torpedo, a model chosen for its long-range and powerful warhead. This particular type utilized hydrogen peroxide as a propellant, a chemical known for its volatile nature, especially under the precise conditions required in submarine operations. The initial blast likely compromised the torpedo's containment, leading to a rapid, uncontrolled chemical reaction that detonated adjacent warheads. This secondary explosion, far greater than the first, was powerful enough to register seismic activity, evidencing the sheer magnitude of the internal destruction. The revelation that the disaster was likely preventable and caused by internal faults within the Navy's own equipment led to a demand for military reform. In response to the mounting pressure, the Russian government initiated a series of investigations and promised to overhaul its naval safety protocols. High-ranking naval officials were dismissed and new funding was allocated to improve safety and rescue capabilities within the Navy. However, for many, these actions were too little, too late. Internationally, the disaster led to renewed calls for global standards and cooperation in submarine rescue operations. NATO and other international bodies began to discuss ways to enhance rescue techniques and technology to ensure that no submarine crew would ever again be left so helplessly imperiled. The Kursk tragedy remains a painful memory in Russian history, a stark reminder of the dangers naval crews face and the dire consequences of neglect and bureaucracy. It has since become a case study in crisis management and governmental responsibility, teaching lessons that resonate well beyond the confines of Russia or the military. Before we wrap up our deep dive into the tragic story of the Kursk submarine, we want to take a moment to thank Audible for supporting this episode. Audible Premium Plus can transform the way you experience stories and books. With Audible, you can explore a vast collection of audiobooks, podcasts, and exclusive titles. Plus, if you sign up today using our special link, you'll get a 30-day free trial, and not just one, but two free audiobooks to start your journey. Whether you're into history, science, or thrilling fiction, Audible has something for everyone. Just click the link in the description or pinned comment. Thank you for joining us in remembering this pivotal moment in naval history. Subscribe to Tech Disasters for more stories like this.